That's all we've got for you guys today. Um, it's good to see you on this Labor Day weekend. And oh, uh, why don't you take a second, turn to your left, turn to your right, and tell your neighbor that you love them, say good morning, so on and so forth. Well, wasn't that lovely and refreshing? Today, indeed, is the Labor Day sermon, and therefore, it is also on rest. We thought it would be a good time uh, in between sermon series to do this one-off sermon on rest. And a little bit of the way through writing this, I'm, I'm going to confess I had a small heart attack because I realized I was writing down a lot of things I had thought I had said before. And it turns out, we went to the records, it turns out that I preached a sermon on Sabbath nigh six or seven months ago. And... We decided to keep it because um, Sabbath and rest are two different things. They are certainly related to each other, um, but they are two different things. So I'll quickly recap that Sabbath sermon, and then we'll get into the meat of rest. First, many months ago, I said Sabbath is characterized by work and rest. That's how to avoid sloth. That's very important. Um, you've got to ask, what are, you, what are you taking a Sabbath from? And that Sabbath is not complete without six days of good work. So that's very important. Uh, furthermore, being slothful is not being restful. Um, if you haven't gotten enough done, sometimes we can irrationally think we haven't gotten enough done. But if we do rationally know we haven't done enough with what we have been given, um, that's not a state of rest. Often there is a restlessness that comes with it. So let's not equate the two. And finally, these last two things, it is important to fill Sabbath with worship. That is what characterize it, characterizes it. Why is that what characterizes it? Because Sabbath is unto the Lord. In Leviticus, when it is institutionalized to God's people, that is the verbiage, that do these things and it will be a Sabbath unto the Lord your God. Therefore, you acknowledge him that day. And if you are taking a day to intensely acknowledge God, then the thing that will naturally flow from that is worship. And it's important to note that I'm not necessarily talking about breaking into song because while the music that we do is indeed worship, not all worship is music. So make sure to infuse that in some way into your Sabbath. And that verbiage, a Sabbath unto the Lord, is where rest and Sabbath differ because rest is something we receive. It is not something we do. Right, Leviticus, a Sabbath unto the Lord. And in, we just finished a study on Joshua with the young adults. And at the end of the book of Joshua, towards the end of the book of Joshua, after all those battles, all those victories, and dealing with some of the problems and sin and the foreshadowing of how it will go later, it says that the Lord gave his people rest. They didn't go and get it. They didn't grab after it, but the Lord gave it to them. And that, war, that word is chenya, and it means uh, leave or place or rest, and it is almost always used spatially. So it is almost always used in reference to a place where rest is happening or a resting place. And, and, and there, at the end of Joshua, the point is that they're being given this place of rest, i.e. the promised land, and it is their job to then steward it well and conduct themselves the way that God wants to conduct themselves. They do that to limiting success, which is why we have more books after the book of Joshua. But that's the point. Let's all turn to Psalm 46. I don't think we can do a good sermon on rest without going through this psalm. And we'll see here at the end of it a different word for rest. So just to point out, you know, we have Shabbat, which is in, in Genesis when God rests. Uh, of course, the root for that would then be Sabbath. So that's one thing. And so not only are these different concepts obviously still related, but they're literally different words in scripture and, and deserve different attention. I'll read Psalm 46 now and then we'll walk through it. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. 
The nations are in an uproar, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Amen. So, We'll walk through Psalm 46, and then we'll keep going. The psalmist accomplishes two things at the beginning by bringing up water and, and mountains, and then here are the two things. One, it is an homage to God's sovereignty over creation, and that's something that you can keep in the back of your head whenever you're going through scripture, especially the Old Testament, when it talks about God controlling elements, Right? It's about God controlling creation because, of, of course, neighboring nations and neighboring faith systems have different gods controlling different elements, gods of water, of rock, and so on and so forth. And so there's always this theme, there's always this slant in scripture. Uh, this God controls things that you attribute just one God to. That's how big and powerful he is. So that's one thing that's being accomplished. But the other thing is this, is that rest is uh, not doesn't exist in a vacuum, it is characterized by its circumstance. So it's not that everything is peaceful and therefore the psalmist is at rest. But the psalmist is talking about this command to be at peace and to have rest in the midst of a restless circumstance that is then characterized by these elements, by these mountains shaking, by, by sea, uh, the sea rising up to such a level, right, that it is above the mountains, which I think is also meant to evoke memories of the creation account. So it's important then when thinking about resting well to think about what you're resting from. I believe that is one of our notes. God brings order to chaos starting in verse four. So where there was once foaming seas, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Where there were once trembling mountains, Right, there is now a city, and so here we have a little microcosm of the overall arch of scripture where God is bringing one of the most godly things God does, one of the things that we can characterize him by his, is his ability to bring order to chaos. Something no one else can do, not only on a creation level, but also on a societal level, because we see that that power over creation extends to human society. The nations are in uproar, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. There is nothing, in other words, that God is not in control of. And verse 11 says then, be still and know that I am God. That word, um, in verse 11, be still is rafa, which means to grow slack or release or let go. It's a submission word, and it's also a very spatial word. And so a popular translation of verse 10, sorry, verse 10, is cease striving and know that I am God. Do you see now, here, again, where rest is something that we cannot clamor after because get this, and I know we all know this in our heads, but we don't act like it, and maybe we don't know it in our hearts. If you anxiously clamor after rest, you will never have it, right? Palms up, people, palms up, and ask to receive rest, and, and God, who knows how to give gifts better than anyone in this room, won't give you a snake, and he won't give you a stone. He'll give you what you're asking for. So if you really want rest, then cease striving and know that he is God. Going back to verse one, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, therefore we will not fear. Of course in Philippians it says that we have access to a peace that passes all understanding, and that's true, but there is an aspect in which we have peace that makes a lot of sense. If you go through Psalm 46, and you read about this all-powerful, sovereign God, sovereign over every aspect of creation, human society notwithstanding, then it makes sense not to fear. That doesn't pass understanding. If you really believe in this God, in who he is, in what he does, in the promises he's made to you, therefore we will not fear, even in the midst of these circumstances. Why? Because we acknowledge 
God's sovereignty over them. What then is the aspect of peace that does pass understanding? Well, for that, we'll go to the other place that a sermon on rest must touch, especially on Labor Day. Please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. I'll give you a second to do that, and we'll, we're going to walk through 11, 28 through 30, and we will see here where, where rest and peace are bound. Again, just like Sabbath and rest are similar, not the same, but certainly they are bound. Rest and peace are similar, not the same, but certainly they are bound. And here is a good binding place. Of course, Jesus says, come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burdens, it, my burden is light. And of course, we understand that the burdens we are to put down are our sins, and that taking on the yoke is an image of submission. And so here is the aspect in which rest and peace pass understanding. It is the salvation aspect. It is the salvific aspect, that soul rest that you get when you know you are secure, the why did God save me, that will never make complete sense that passes all understanding. And that is then bound to what does, what, what is able to be understood. Well, like, I don't understood why God saved me, but I understood that he did. So then I won't fear. So the understanding and the passing understanding, of, of course, are related. So rest is not just about sanctification, but it is also about salvation. Have you submitted yourself to Christ? wholeheartedly have you found access to that soul rest, those beautiful words, that soul rest. And here we see that, that while, while Sabbath is generally can be described as a rhythm of rest, here um, rest and peace is a state of being. And that's something that we know inherently, right? We, we say things like, I am well rested. Right? And then we carry that with us. After, after a time of rest, you realize that you carry it with you, and maybe you're more at peace. And certainly that intrinsic thing that we know about rest does apply to Scripture because it is a state of being, that soul rest, that it, it's baked into your being now. No one can take it from you. No circumstances, even the circumstances we talked about before, which is apocalyptic earthquakes and floods, cannot take from you the rest that God can impart on you. Hmm. What then are we to do, brothers and sisters? Well, Rest as a state of being is important to talk about because it is the place where the inbreaking of the kingdom happens in the life of the individual believer. Uh, a very popularly, and we've talked about it before here from this pulpit, the kingdom of heaven as described by Jesus can be, can be described as already and not yet. Right, because Jesus will say things like the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and then he'll talk about it as, as things that are happening in the future. And both are true. When the, son of, when the incarnate Son of God comes down and says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he's not lying about it. But then we also have all these parables about being prepared, about staying alert, about staying diligent for what is to come. And so we refer to that as the already and not yetness of the kingdom of God. And, and a lot of us know, well, well, we don't know what the not yetness looks like, but we know um, the goodness, the peace, the lack of sin, so on and so forth, and we can look forward to that. And then we th when we think about what the alreadiness is, often that is characterized as spirit-filled good works. And I don't want to say that that's not part of it, but when, we, when you think about what does the alreadiness of the kingdom of heaven look like? What does the breaking in of the kingdom of heaven look like? What is Jesus talking about when he says, on earth as it is in heaven, and that's present tense? Often we think about the good works that we can do, and of course when they're sp spirit-filled, they are indeed good works, things like charity, things like prayer. And that's not wrong, 
But where then is the breaking in in the life of the individual believer? I believe that that breaking in is that state of peace that could not exist without God's imparting of it. That peace and joy that we will have access to, not only have access to, but be able to enjoy not in part of circumstances, but because of our circumstances, when we do get to the kingdom, we can have glimpses, we can have access to it now, right? Brothers and sisters, whenever you face a trial of any kind, count it nothing but joy. That's not an aspiration. It's really possible. Why? Because if we believe God is who he says he is, if we know that he has done the things that he has done and will fulfill his promises just as he has, then while it will still be difficult because our joy and peace will be in spite of these circumstances, it is absolutely possible. And when, when God fills us and we can pull it off, then we are having access to the joy and peace that we will have because of our circumstances later when we get to heaven. Well, what does it look like? What then are we to do? I think the most important thing to do is to resist the lies of the world and to never be existentially threatened because the world is going to say, here are your circumstances, therefore be angry. Here are your circumstances, therefore get anxious. Here are your circumstances, therefore hate this person or hate that person or at least stop being nice to them. And, and the way that peace and rest resist these things is because if, if we are still, Right? If we cease striving, we cannot be existentially threatened. There's nothing circumstantially in this world that says, okay, well, now I'm no longer secure. In my, like, now, now, now I no longer have God because of these circumstances. But that's going to be the lie of the world. If this happens, all is lost. If this happens, this will change forever. Well, things are going to change forever, but that's already set in stone. What it's going to look like is already set in stone. Resist the lies of the world. Resist being existentially threatened, because if we understand God to be who he is, we cannot be existentially threatened. And I know it's a tall order to simply say, be at rest, to simply say, be at peace in all these things. Something that I really hold on to is that any edict in scripture is there because it is difficult. If we did any of the things that we should do that are in the Bible, they probably wouldn't have made it in the Bible because we already do them. And so God's command in 46, or Jesus' invitation to salvific rest here in Matthew 11, they take time, they're hard, and I think they're most possible when we're in community. Because if, if I just sit by myself on my phone and go through the news and, and read about how the world is falling apart and, and, and get tempted to be existentially threatened, um, and there's no one there to remind me about the God who I have submitted my life to, it gets a lot harder to hold on to peace or to be in a calm posture of receiving rest. And so I think one of the best things we can do to have access to it is what we're doing right now. Um, and frankly, I, what we do on Wednesday nights, those are electric, come on, getting together for a meal, doing Bible studies, choir rehearsal. I love that and it does give me peace in the middle of my week. So let's remember that as the world continues to attempt to lie to God's people, hold on to the truth that we can have peace, that we cannot be existentially threatened. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for this church and the people you have filled it with. Lord, as we go into our week, please use your spirit to put us into a posture that we can receive your rest, that we can receive your peace. Lord, help us cease our striving and help us to align our will with yours. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.